okay, here's another Microsoft Flight Simulator soaring video. And uh, my intent here is just to kind of give you a heads up on the new LS4 glider that uh, Modolo plus B21 is working on. Um, the glider is close enough, I'm going to show you it. The glider is close enough to be ready that we're confident we're going to deliver it. Uh, but it's not yet finished, but I will show you what we're doing and explain why we're doing it. And uh, Modolo plus B21, just make it clear, there's two of us. There's Brett, who's doing all the modeling, and uh, I'm B21, which is doing the programming. Uh, in particularly including the instruments, but there's a flying model and the sounds to continue, that kind of stuff. Now we're starting with the, we, our first glider that we delivered was the AS33 uh, self-launching, electric self-launching glider, which is uh, this glider I've got in the sim now. And it is far too complicated a glider for people reasonably to start their soaring experience with. I know you can do it in a sim because you can crash it, it doesn't make any difference. But really it is a highly twitchy, uh, very high performance aircraft with a lot of very complicated features. It carries a water ballast, so these are the water ballast which is here which make the glider heavier. It defaults to launching full of ballast. Uh, it has an engine that retracts. Uh, it has flaps. Um, it has eight different flap settings. Um, and with those, and it has a very, there's something like a dozen different instruments are actually implemented on this panel using the digital capabilities that we've got. So, for example, this instrument down here isn't really one instrument, it's about five different instruments. It's showing you the wind direction, it's showing you the compass position, it's showing what in, when it makes sense, it shows you what the ballast level is. If I start dumping ballast, it starts showing you. Uh, that's dumping ballast in outer tanks at the moment. So they're going down, you can't quite see it, but they are. Um, it is actually a very complicated panel and a complicated glider. Okay, so uh, it has these flaperons, which are these are the flaps. Um, which go, they, they alter the profile of the wing, then they don't actually operate quite the same as flaps in a conventional aircraft like a Cessna or a jumbo jet, which are very large, very high drag, very high additional lift planks that get lowered into the airstream, which actually act more like speed brakes than anything else in a normal aircraft, really. Although they provide a lot of additional lift as well. Uh, glider flaps aren't the same thing at all. They're actually altering the contour of the wing and consequently altering the uh, performance of the glider, making it more optimized towards flying slowly and circling in climbs or, or flying very fast uh, and uh, heading off in a straight line. Perfect glide performance. Okay, so it's all pretty cool. We, uh, these instruments are carefully done to be very accurate and appropriate for gliding scenario, where they're not, they're not conventional power aircraft. Uh, these are variometers which are the gliding equivalent of vertical speed indicators, except you can see you have, we've got three here between these two dials. That's uh, three different variometer readings, um, of which this one in the bottom right hand corner is uh, kind of the most fundamental one, but it's still not just a simple vertical rate of climb reading. It is the vertical rate of climb minus a calculation due to whether the glider is actually accelerating or decelerating. That's telling you, telling you, telling you whether it's actually climbing uphill or sliding downhill. Where uh, you know it will be gaining energy anyway, just by accelerating, you've got to deduct that from the rate of sink because you're going to get that energy back as soon as you pull back up, right? So gliders, you want to separate that out. That's what uh, total energy compensation does, and in this case, it also subtracts the actual sink rate that is calculated for the glider at the current flap setting, at the current ballast setting, at the current speed. Uh, this thing has designed into it what is the normal sink rate of the glider given those parameters. And it subtracts that from your actual total energy sink rate um, and you get something called netto which is an assumption of what the outside air must be doing given that current situation. So this needle is kind of really sensitive we did it to set the bar relatively high for a Sobo um, for when they introduced gliding into the sim. We wanted proper instruments, uh, a variety of capabilities, 
so that we wouldn't just yet again get the generic gliding capability of a completely stock vertical speed indicator and a flight model that is a million miles off and weather that doesn't work and thermals that are out are wrong by a factor of 10. Uh, and it turns out, something I didn't really work out at the time, we did this instrument accurately enough, like it's reading zero now, you know, whatever. It's still air, it reads zero because it's subtracting everything. It's subtracting the forms of the glider, your speed, all these things. It can work out. It's really quite sensitive. What's the air doing? It turns out this plane is the best plane to fly around if you want to explore what what's the air doing. Is the air going up or going down? Uh, near a ridge or underneath a cumulus cloud? Those kind of things. You just watch this needle and it tells you what the air outside the glider is doing. Uh, in a very fundamental way. It's just looking at what's happening to the glider and it knows what normally would happen to the glider anyway if it was in dead still air and it takes the difference between those two things. So it's not actually just taking some hack out of the sim and saying, well, sim, you tell me what, what currently what vertical air movement are you simulating and I'm going to use that and write it. I'm just going to take that single number I'm going to write it on a gauge because that tends to be wrong. Uh, and this is doing it much more fundamentally. It has the glider flying. The glider knows, we've tested it a million times, the glider knows exactly what sink rate. Say you're doing uh, 56 knots, you're going to be coming down at one knot. But if this, by looking at the height, shows that you're coming down faster than a knot, then it seems, oh, you must be in a bit of sink then. And it knows exactly how much and it was on there. OK, so that's all fairly important. And we did it because we wanted to get it done pre the introduction of gliding by a Sobo slash Microsoft. So they knew what good looked like. Um, okay. Um, but it's not a great glider to start your gliding experience in. Uh, there's one particular bit of feedback, you know, I kind of noticed, which is the glider is awful. It's almost impossible to fly. And uh, I'm pretty sure the guy that wrote that comment, you know, in other words, he couldn't even get it off the runway. And uh, I'm pretty sure the guy that wrote that comment would not get a real AS-33 off the runway either. You know, I'm sure the guy who wasn't the guy wasn't a glider pilot, never flown one before. You kind of, oh, this plane's terrible. I, I crash it all the time. And you go, yeah, well, you just suck. <laughs> You've got to, these things are complicated to fly. But credits of people flying in simulators, you, you get the hang of pretty much anything, whether it's an FA-18 or, or a world-class championship when you're racing glider or a Cessna. So you do get there in the end. But the AS-33, this plane, the AS-33, is a bad place to start. Um, okay, so what we've been working on is the next glider. We could have done this one first. It would have been a little more logical to do it first if it were not for the fact we're trying to set the bar for a Sobo, um, you know, with a glider. So this glider is the one Brett and I are working on. Brett has been doing all the modelling, done a great job on it, um, and it is a 15 metre standard class glider which means the wingspan is set at 15 meters. You'll find out all the gliders competing in this category really have that fixed wingspan, which is great. It makes the class really competitive. There are no flaps. So uh, the wing is a fixed aerofoil. And you know you have the um, uh, ailerons as normal, um, but you're working with a, with a fixed wing profile. OK, and it's still reasonably high performance. It's a um, it's not the glider you would train in, but it is a glider you would reasonably, after you've gone solo and had a few check flights, um, you would be let go in this glider, allowed to go fly solo in this glider. But it's a 40 to 1 glide ratio, um, perfectly good, flies really, really nicely. And we've done a couple of other things. What I'm intending is, even though this glider takes water ballast, there's the ballast dump lever, will actually default when you start it to being empty. Okay, so those people that kind of get into the glider and just fly it. I've noticed with the ballast we have on the AS33, which is frankly a ridiculous amount of ballast, it makes the wing loading really, really high, which is what you need if you want to win the World Championship, uh, if you think of it in terms of windsurfers. You know, the people that win World Championships on windsurfers have got windsurfers about the size of a dinner plate, and they sink. They, sink. they, won't, they won't even, you know, they need the wind to be above a certain speed, even to even stay above the surface of the water. Um, a World Championship racing glider has got to have that kind of capability. So you fill it right up to the gills in with water, make it way, way heavier than it is when it's empty. And uh, the glider kind of flies like a lawn dart after that. That's what you do in the AS33. So this, and people were just flying the glider 
taking off, flying it, landing, completely ignoring the fact that the water was in there, and um, which the, the glider isn't specified. None of the, none of the gliders are specified to land with the water still carried. You've got to dump it um, before you land. And um, yeah, it makes the landing a hell of a lot harder if, you, if you're still carrying all that water because you have so much momentum. Anyway, so this glider defaults to being empty. Um, turn the battery on. Um, but you can fill it up while you're on the ground. I'll kind of demonstrate this. At the moment, this number here, on this is the same two varios effectively as on the AS33. Um, if you click the ballast lever once, ballast switch once, it tells you how much ballast you've got, which is zero. If you click it a second time, within a certain amount of time, you know, within, within six seconds, that acts as a ballast request and it fills it up. So it's gone to 100. Okay, and then if you want to dump it, you can put the dump lever. And if the ballast is changing, it displays the ballast. It, this glider isn't finished, so whether we leave the ballast displaying there, or in fact do it somewhere else on the panel, it's still up for grabs. Uh, we, we might do that, uh, which might make sense. And I can explain, I'll stop dumping it, and you'll see this will stop displaying, and it'll display that strange number 53 again in a second. Yeah. Oh, 60, because we're carrying ballast. Okay, so I'll keep, I'll keep dumping the ballast. See how long? It takes a minute and 15 seconds, I think, to dump all the ballast. Like that. Um, okay, to explain the glider, look, see, there's no flap lever. This is the um, spoilers handle. Um, you've got canopy release. Um, my point is going to be you haven't got many things to play with. There is a trim lever, trim forward, trim back, um, on that same pivot as on a real LS4 that we've simulated, there's the gear up, gear down lever. Okay, so at the moment are hints, oh no, they're okay at the moment. Depending on how zoomed in you are, these, these two messages overlap at the moment, I can go fix that. And over here you've got the ballast open close. So the ballast is still dumping, we're down at 16%. Uh, and these gauges are kind of fixed function. They don't flip around into lots of different modes the way they do on the AS33. So what you see is what you get. Um, if you click the face, these are what I would call, speaking of somebody called B21, Private 21, which is my competition registration number for my glider. Uh, if you click the face, it will toggle between whatever the units the gauge is generally intended to use. So this is an airspeed indicator. It's going to use either knots or kilometers per hour. Okay, so if I click it, currently it's in knots because it says knots on it and it maxes out about, the red line is around about 150 knots. If I click it, it's now in meters per second. No, no, sorry, it's now in kilometers per hour, you know, going up much higher. Okay, so you can tell when you're using B21 gauges, this is my joke, you can tell because they do that, and they will remember that for your next flight. Next time you load the glider, it will remember what did you set these gauges to. Plus, the gauges kind of talk to each other, and they're using a common set of units. So if this is this is a climb rate, uh, climb units, which are in knots, if I change it on this one, it changes on that one as well. But nothing else changes. Uh, okay, yeah. altimeter, same thing. It can. Sorry, you have, to, you have to click it on the edge. I was looking for where can I click it and get it to change. But if they change, if they change like that on any glider you're flying, my gauges are, I think, in every glider that is currently flying in Microsoft Flight Simulator. And if you, if you click it somewhere and it toggles its units, that is a dead giveaway that it's a Bravo 21 gauge. The good news is it means it is doing properly what it should be doing for a glider. Um, other aircraft tend to rely heavily on just using power aircraft gauges. Um, the nav gauge is clearly a lot simpler than the full map panel that is in the AS33, but it's actually got all the same sensible kind of bits of the programming are included behind the gauge. So the user interface doesn't look much, but behind it, it is doing the, um, it's loading the Microsoft flight plan. It's working out from that, what would the glider task be? 
given a Microsoft uh, flight plan. And it's calculating things like distance to the waypoints and predicted arrival heights at those waypoints. And it is doing it for every waypoint in the flight plan. Um, the difference is obviously a much simpler display. So it's saying, yep, the current waypoint is off to our left. Is at a distance of zero. Um, incidentally, for this flight, we don't have a flight plan loaded. Um, and what it does is if you, if you haven't loaded a flight plan, it generates one, it auto generates one, and it has a single waypoint in it, which is wherever you're sitting on the ground when the flight started. So it's generated a waypoint plan with a single waypoint here where we are. And it's saying that's zero kilometers away, and we're going to arrive at 360 feet. And that distance is always rounded down to the nearest 10 feet or the nearest five meters. If we didn't round it down, I'd do the same thing in the S33. If you don't round it down a little bit, the number is kind of constantly changing just by a foot at a time. It's going up, down, up, down, up, down as, you, as it's doing its calculations. Um, that's just more annoying to look at. So what you do is you just have it only change every 10 feet or every five meters. That means the change, the rate of change of the number is slower, and then you notice when it's changing rapidly, like you're falling out of the cloud. Um, and it rounds it down rather than rounding it to the nearest 10 feet because it's safer to round down. It's, it's, it's telling you you're going to arrive at 360 feet. But actually, the correct answer is 369 because we're sitting on top of the waypoint here. Okay, and then these calculations. If I, there's no engine in here, so we're relying on um, either Alex's launch method or the Sobo delivering something with their gliding support. We're assuming they will, um, or you can slew into the air. Which we'll do. This is Blairstown, New Jersey. That is the Delaware Water Gap over there. That's the Appalachian Ridge is starting. I'm just climbing. We, the initial speed we came out of uh, SLU at is configured wrong. So we started running at 200 knots or something like that. I just used it to climb. So there you go. So we're at a sensible speed. We're not carrying any ballast. If you remember, we dumped it. I'm going to trim forward a little bit. Okay. And what I'll do, the last thing I'll talk about here, is um, I'll just show you the glider first of all. That's the upper reservoir, and Delaware will work out. Um, just going to show you the speed to fly calculation, which is this number you're showing here. And the basic idea behind speed to fly is um, if you accept, first of all, just to make it absolutely clear, this vario is the netto vario, and it's telling us what is the air doing outside the glider, and this is saying it's not doing anything. Okay. Um, that depends upon an accurate flight model in the glider. It's already got an accurate flight model built into the actual gauge for the LS4, which, which this glider is. Um, but I haven't finished tuning the flight model for the LS4 yet. So it's actually saying, you know what, I think the air's going up slightly. Uh, that's actually not the air going up. That's, that's the, um, the performance of the flight model at the moment, slightly better than it should be. Uh, it's not far off, obviously, you can see. OK, so that's the netto instrument, which will tell you what's the air doing outside the glider. This is the total energy instrument, um, which is saying, aha, well, if you really want to know what we're doing is we're coming down at about a knot and a half. Okay, and if I speed up, you'll see we'll come down faster. Okay, as I'm accelerating, the faster you go, the faster you come down. But that doesn't alter. If you look at the netto gauge, it's still reading around zero. Because what's happening is the, um, the computer is taking into account, okay, well, I know you're going faster, so I know the plane would normally be coming down um, faster. So I'm going to net that out, and you can see the netto reading. Okay, but again, I want to make the point: the flight model's not finished yet for the LS4, so the netto instrument won't be getting it exactly right. Well, the netto is getting exactly right; it's the plane isn't getting it exactly right at the moment, but it will do. Okay, now 
what speed to fly is, is this number here. The glider is currently telling us, given the current conditions, you should be flying at 53 knots to get the optimal cross-country speed. Right, so that's the objective normally in gliding, is how do I get, say I'm going to fly down to um, uh, some waypoint, off in the distance here, on the ridge. Um, it's saying, if you fly at 53 knots, you will get there the fastest. If you fly faster than that, you're going to come down too fast, it's going to take you longer ultimately to get there, and if you fly slower than that, you're going to just dawdle, you're going to take too long to get there. And that speed is crucially based on um, what thermal strength you've told this set of instruments you're expecting between here and your waypoint. And see the zero here. Um, we're telling the glider we're expecting a, zero, a, a thermal strength of zero. And it's going, OK, fly 53 knots then, because that is the best glide speed. So you'll either make it or not, but, uh, but the ultimately that turns into well, the optimal distance you can get. But this MacReady knob, it's called MacReady. So this MacReady knob, if you can watch the number changing here, it's also, it's also changing temp temporarily there, is, so okay, well actually I'm expecting a climb of, my climb, a climb of one knot, which is a pretty weak thermal. Uh, and it's going, oh, well in that case, fly, fly a bit faster, fly 61 knots, because you can fly along, then you climb, then you fly along, then you can climb. And if you're gonna get climbs of a knot, then it's worth flying a little bit faster, take advantage of those climbs. And if I speed that up to say four knots, and say, well, now I think you ought to fly at 77 knots in between those thermals. Okay, because the stronger the thermal is, your cross country speed is optimized by flying faster. You still fly at minimum sync when you're in the thermal. You're gonna, you're gonna sit and you're gonna sort of gently, gently circle like this in the thermal, going up as fast as you can, you know, you're just trying to sink as little as you can because you're simply going round and round in a thermal, uh, like that. I'm actually going to head, there you go, I'm going to use the nav to head back to Blairstown. Oops. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh, sorry, I was just looking at the scenery as well. I used to live here, my house where that lake is. We used to live on that lake. Um, yeah, so basically it's saying uh, if you're going to set the thermal strength at 4 knots, fly at 77 knots. If I set the thermal strength at 10 knots, um, it's going to fly, say, fly at 109 knots. So you're going to be zinging through the air, get to a 10 knot thermal, climb super fast in a 10 knot thermal, and then you're going to zing through the air at 110 knots. Again. That's what speed to fly is. Okay, now in the, um, in practice, what you've got to understand is, so I've set the thermals to 44, it's saying fly at 77 knots. That is assuming still air. Okay, so this figure isn't going to change. It's going to say, look, the average speed you're going to fly at is 77 knots. If the air around you is sinking, i.e. you are flying through sink, in general, you fly faster if you're in sink, if you're going through any body of air in a glider, if the air is sinking, fly faster. If the air is rising, fly more slowly. And ultimately, if the air is rising at four knots or above, stop and circle in it. Okay, that is the speed to fly technique. If the air is only rising at two knots, then slow down, but don't stop and thermal. Because you're saying, no, I'm expecting a four knot thermal, you know, further on, presumably. But it will say, slow down when you're in rising air, speed up when you're in sinking air. So in general, when you're flying around for glider pilots, it's not like a Cessna, which is where you're sort of maintaining a certain kind of altitude, regardless of what you're flying through, and you just sort of chug your way through it. In a glider, you're absolutely maximizing the energy you get from the air. And that means you, if there's sink, fly faster. If there's lift, fly slower. And you can see that works out. If on average, the air isn't going up or down, but some of it's going up, some of it's going down, you're actually gaining a bit more height in the uplift then you're losing in the sink because you're going through the sink more quickly or whatever but you dawdle in the uplift and that kind of lifts you up okay so there is a sort of slightly subtle question of well how do you know whether to speed you know speed up slow down how much and what we do 
is having set a four knot climb rate and it said right fly on average at 77 knots you can put this needle into speed to fly mode if you look on the panel here te and speed to fly if i put it in speed to fly mode right what it is basically telling us is the needle pointing downward says speed up it's, it's telling us you're in sync speed up which is not really saying we are in sync you see this needle we're not in sync but we're flying slower than we should do so that's the equivalent you do the same thing as you would do if you were in sync so you'll see if we speed up i'm doing 60 knots at the moment if i speed up to 77 that needle is going to read zero okay there's 70 knots i'm watching the asi on the left okay there we go doing 77 knots and the needle is reading around is leading around zero okay that kind of number if i fly too fast Oh, I can just see Blairstown Airport in front of us. So now it's working. Fly too fast. It's saying you're in lift. Effectively, the arrow is pointing out. What it actually means is pull up. Slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. Right, you're flying too fast. So that is what a speed to fly needle is. And that is taking a million things into account now at this point. There's a whole complicated variometer calculation going on. It knows whether the air is going up and down. It knows how fast you're flying. It knows what the optimal speed to be flying would be in zero sync and then it adjusts that speed correctly according to well if you're not in zero sync if you're in sort of plus one knot lift maybe you should slow down a bit if you're in minus one lift i.e plus one sync you should speed up a bit and it knows how much by and that needle will move accordingly um, the difference between what i've done here in the ls4 versus what i did in the as33 is i don't change the number that's in this um, STF box here um, just to make it simpler for the pilots but it's just saying look fly at 77 it's not a big deal whether you speed up or slow down in lift or sink if you're caning along if it's four knots just like tonk along 80 knots but in fact if you just keep general eye on the needle if it looks like sink just fly a bit faster if it looks like lift fly a bit slower and then when you so we'll be tonking along here let's say we're doing 77 knots uh, maybe through through a bit of sinks so we sped up a bit so we're doing 90 knots and then we reach our thermal we've just got to our cloud we would be looking a bit more sensibly like that so we've got to our cloud and then we're going to pull up bank over this is demonstrating th slow right down um, demonstrating thermals Ooh. there you go i stalled and span um, yeah anyway we'd pull up we'd be thermaling in our beautiful four knot thermal and then off we'd go again again at 77 knots okay so that is the speed to fly theory that if you click this needle down and say oh, it always tells you the speed to fly anyway the sort of average speed to fly the zero sync but this needle by default is still operating as a total energy needle if you like that's a total energy needle if you click that switch down it now operates it looks similar uh, that's what's clever about it but it's telling you something else it's actually telling you the same thing it would be saying in lift and sync you'd normally slow down and lift speed up and sync anyway that needle is now moving accordingly but it's not really telling you it's lift or sync it's kind of adjusting it to kind of say you're expecting a four knot thermal and uh, if the lifts if there's some lift there you should be slowing down if there's some if there's some sync there you should be speeding up and that needle as long as you keep that needle around zero which i'm going to do here because there are no thermals in microsoft fly simulator it's basically telling me to fly somewhere around 77 all the time there you go so that's what i'm doing so i'll be flying like this you don't have to chase the needle but i'd be flying something like that i'm kind of going along until i get to a thermal i'll turn the thermal on. okay so that is it in a nutshell which cover two things uh, one was this whole idea of speed to fly if you've never seen it before you're going to have to watch it a second time probably sorry i didn't explain it perfectly but. Um, and the new ls4 standard class glider with ballast but by default it is not filling the plane up so a lot of early pilots will just fly it anyway they won't actually put ballast in it um, and it has got nice handling and a 40 to 1 is a perfectly nice cross-country performance um, and it has nothing like especially especially without ballast has nothing like the high speed performance of the as33 if 
if you want to fly, like the S33, you can fly at a sort of 100, 120 knots. I'm going to do here. There you go. That's 120 knots. Um, in the LS4, you'll be coming down pretty fast at 120 knots. It, at 53 knots, it's got a 40 to 1 glide ratio. You can go a long way on that. Um, but at this high speed I'm flying, you're coming down like a rock. Which on the AS33, you're not, because it goes into negative flap. It's typically carrying a vast amount of ballast anyway. All uh, right, and this field here. We'd always have this field. No, it's not a field. It is actually an airstrip. We'd have it as an emergency airstrip if we'd really cocked up the Blair down and we were going to make it, make it back to the airport. Um, didn't happen very often. Normally, if we landed out, we'd be further away. All right, so that's it. It's maybe a month or so. We'll um, put this glider up on uh, flysim.tf.